You have your Bibles or electronic devices, whatever you're utilizing. We are in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. We'll take up the text starting in verse 3. I'll read through verse 11, though I'll say at, at first here that we will only be looking at the first six verses. But these were written together. And he says this, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to himself also walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you. But an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brothers in the darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, but there is no cause of for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. John continues on in this letter written to believers so that they could determine whether or not that they had an encounter with the Lord. There are words here in the original language that's hidden because of the English. English is not an exacting language. Words such as, by this we know. That word know can mean a lot of different types of knowing. It's important that we determine what that know is. Another thing that people notice about this section is it starts us, now by this we know, seems to assume here that it's a new section in the letter. And many people would say, yes, it is. But really, when you want to look at this, it's really a continuation of what John has already said. He's already written to these believers and has said to them that they have assurance and advocate and the perpetuation of Jesus Christ in their lives. He's talking about the benefits of a relationship with Christ, how his life is forever altered. He started out this letter saying just that, how the impact that Christ had in his life in the initial few years of knowing Jesus forever changed it. Even 70 years later, it was forever altered. He talked about that encounter. Now he's writing to a group of people that never physically saw Christ, didn't know him on the earth as John did. And he wants to make sure that he understands, that the people understand that the relationship they can have with him is life-altering. It's never going to change. But things that come into the church, mainly through Gnostic or higher knowledge, such a false set of teachings identified that it was more of an intellectual uh, ascertainment of, of truth than it was a personal encounter with truth. If you go back to your own Christian life, or if you just think about, take it away from the spiritual and go to the physical realm for a moment, just a practical everyday life and people you know. You can know somebody. Last week I talked about uh, being somewhere in the Dominican Republic and, and shaking the hands of Carl Malone. Now I could say I know Carl Malone, but I really don't know Carl Malone. I have no relationship with Carl Malone. If I knock on his door, wherever he lives, somewhere in Louisiana, I think, and say, hey, Carl, good to see you. I'm going to come in and hang out with you for a while. He probably would not let me in the door. I don't know him. I know of him. I can read about him. I've met him, shook his hand. That's the extent of it. But yet, I can use the word I know him. I don't know him. I don't have a relationship with Carl Malone. We use words like that, and that's the problem when it comes to a faith in Christ and Christianity. There are a lot of people that say they know Jesus. They know of Jesus. They might even use the words, I believe in Jesus. And I always say, do you believe of Jesus or in Jesus? You know, there's, there's a whole lot in Christianity that needs to be defined 
How do we know this? How can we determine this? John's letter isn't so that we can point that out for someone else. It's a self-test. So all we need to do is when you read the words, now by this we know, we need to ask ourselves the question, by what do we now know? <laughs> how, how do I know what this is uh, relating to? And so John comes up with a two-fold test here, and it's a self-test. This isn't so that it's a pass or fail or so you can get your theological degree. It's so that you can look at this and know whether or not you truly have a relationship with Christ. And of course, it all revolves around transformation. Again, there are so many people. I was reading the biography the other day, uh, just listening, and this will date me, but I was listening to Bob Dylan. Some of you guys remember Bob Dylan. But he had a period of time where he made a profession of faith in Christ. Uh, and, and I was just curious. I, I didn't know much about it. I remember it uh, back in the day when in the 70s. I think it was 78. That'll date me. Um, I was no longer in high school, so that's okay. But, you know, I, I was just reading his conversion and what happened and how that happened. And it lasted for about three years until the church he was attending told him he needed to renounce Judaism. He's Jewish. He couldn't renounce his, he couldn't really renounce his, who he was. It's like you being an Italian saying, I'm going to renounce being an Italian. He's Jewish. And uh, so in later interviews, he uh, has continued to talk about his faith in Christ. Uh, it's interesting. Most of his concerts, he plays the albums in which he hymns and things like that. He still has maintained his faith. He's just walked away from organized Christianity and religiosity, which is interesting. Now, I don't know him personally, but everything I would encounter uh, from reading about his own words would indicate he's maintained his relationship with Christ to some level anyway. Now, again, I... I I want to say that there are a lot of people that come by faith in Christ or knowledge of Christ because of their parents. Nothing wrong with that. Many of you may have done that. Your parents, you were raised in the church. Um, some of you um, came about during difficult seasons where you had knowledge given to you about Christ and you have seemed to be logical, made sense, and you came forward. None of those things are the same indication of a personal relationship. A personal relationship may have some of those things as well, but there's a different form of intimacy. And what John is addressing here is so that we can determine what, what do we really have with Jesus? Because there's only one thing in, our, in terms of a relationship that will save you, and that is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not knowledge of him, but saving faith in Christ. And so he's making certain, because he's identified the benefits of a relationship with Christ, assurance, an advocate. He's talked about all the benefits of that, but he wants to make sure that the people who are reading this are not just mere professors of faith. It's just people who are, and in and, and, and his time, there were people there that were professors of faith, and John knew the difference. This wasn't some sort of, and when you, when you read a passage in which he says uh, in verse 4, he says, I know him and does not keep his commandments as a liar, and that's a pretty bold statement. And it can come across very caustic to somebody. If you say to somebody, you're a liar, it, it kind of gets you a little upset. But I want you to understand that John's saying this and for your benefit. Not, for your, not to be mean-spirited. He wants to make certain that those who are reading this letter are really benefiting from the, the assurances given in Christ. He doesn't want to discourage anybody, but he doesn't want to encourage. He's kind of playing the middle road when he, reads, when he writes this. He wants to make certain that they're more than just mere pretenders of their faith. Because there's nothing worse than thinking your whole life that you're a believer in Christ because of what you know, but you never knew him. Jesus said the same thing. He said, many in those days will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do these things? And he says, get away from me, you evildoers, for I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. And again, 
Back to my story with Carl Malone. I can say I know Carl Malone, but I don't know Carl Malone. Shaking his hand doesn't mean I know him. Attending a church doesn't mean you know him. Having a Bible doesn't mean you know Jesus. None of those things are, are alone indicators. So what are the indicators? How can we know? Well, John has two uh, twofold tests here, a transformative test to know whether or not you're a believer. This is so that you and I can take this test ourselves and determine whether or not we're truly a believer. The first one is found in verses 3 through 6. You'll see it right up front. It's obedience. Now, he's going to address this in a positive and a negative. The negative is found in verse 4. So I, he who says, I know him, but does not do his commandments would be an indication there's a lack of obedience. <clears throat> in other words, if I go to church, but I'm not following his word, if I deviate and habitually practice sin, as he's already mentioned, then I'm an indicating here that I don't have a relationship with Christ. I may have a relationship with a church I attend, uh, with family members who are, who are Christians, but I do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ if I'm not walking in obedience. And the word walking is habitually ordering your steps. In other words, there needs to be a transformative uh, work of Christ in your life that when you met him, what you used to do is what you used to do, not continue to do. We have a society and church life now is altering this, changing the dynamic. Human sexuality, the evangelical church is changing its position on that. It's changing its position on a lot of different things. This section of scripture would probably be very divisive in many churches. Yet John writes the letter. The second test is found in verses uh, two, uh, verses rather, chapter two, verses seven through eleven, and that is love. So one is upward, the other one's outward. First off, it'll be seen, and I notice the order of this. The first test is self-test, is whether we're going to obey the word of God in our lives. And we need to be careful looking at this, as we'll see in a moment, because he uses the word law here. Interesting, he's not talking about the First Testament law, commandments. Now, I'm not disregarding the law that way. He's using a word that speaks of the words of Christ. That's the focus here. So when you look at this passage of Scripture, he begins to out lie it for us so that we can see it, making sure that somebody doesn't fall under self-deception. Again, I don't find this section of Scripture, when I put it in context, is anything but loving. He makes certain that those that were reading this can have all the full benefits as the assurances of Christ, be encouraged, but not falsely. There's nothing worse than somebody who'd be Self-deceived. It's the worst type of deception there is. And so John speaks it this way. And again, he starts off with the phrase, uh, the, uh, the, so that the believer can enjoy that assurance, by this we know that we know him. The emphasis, again, on the assurance is to ourselves, so that we can have the full understanding of a true relationship with Jesus. I mean, if you go to most people, and I'm sure if you just turn to your neighbor sitting next to you, do you know Jesus? They're going to answer yes, and they probably do. But I remember years ago being in Bible college and uh, sitting there in, a, in the church service, a big church, and, uh, and I'm sitting in church service, and my wife uh, was sitting next to me, my little kids in Sunday school. And I've been in church by that time for about eight years of my life. And uh, during a little break, kind of like what Herman does, greet one another, this lady, elderly lady, turned to me. She goes, young man, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? I was in Bible college there. I mean, and at first I got a little bit upset. I kind of, who are you? Do you, you know? And, you know, I got a little bit, hair went up in the back of my neck a little bit. And, and uh, I said, yeah. She goes, well, when did you meet him? And she began to question my faith in Christ. And uh, I said, well, eight years ago, I'm in Bible college here. She goes, that doesn't mean anything. I go, really? You know? And uh, she goes, do you have a personal relationship? Have you met him? 
And I said, yes, I have. And as I sat down there, I was still kind of reeling from her questioning a little bit. My wife sitting next to me saying, what did she say? I said, no, no, no. Didn't want to talk about it a little bit. And <clears throat> during the worship songs that preceded that, the Lord began to speak. And she just did the greatest act of love any human being to another. She wanted to make certain of your faith and commitment to the one who loves you so. So afterwards, I turned to her and I said, thank you for asking me that. I got to admit, I was a little upset. She goes, I could tell. I go, but I thank you. You really were concerned whether I'd spend eternity with the Lord, whether I was receiving all the benefits of that relationship. Thank you. That's all that John's doing. He wants to make certain. Are you enjoying, in, a, in essence, that's what John is asking, are you enjoying the personal conscious relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you enjoying that? I mean, it's like if you go to a fine restaurant and you're eating the food and the, the chef comes out from behind the kitchen and says, are you enjoying your meal? That's what he's asking. Are you enjoying this? Is this, is it, oh, it's the best ever. Now, last night I, I cooked up a steak. I had a steak in the freezer I didn't realize I had, vacuum sealed, it was good. And I cooked some sautéed some mushrooms and onions, put it on there, made dinner for Denise and I, and had, had a salad on the side. We're sitting at our counter. I go, how's your steak? She goes, amazing. And I thought about that in terms of this. How's your relationship with Christ? Amazing. The steak just melted in your mouth. The onions, I know you guys are going to want to eat after this, but it was just incredible. <laughs> And I got to admit, I took something with the mushrooms I had never done before. I took and slow sauteed them. Oh, never mind. No, I did. I so I in butter and bourbon. Oh. Amazing. Would to God that each of us, when asked about a relationship with Christ, would say, "Amazing! It's amazing." How do we, are we enjoying this? Or do all we have is a mere intellectual knowledge of him? Are we settling for something that thinks it has all the benefits and the assurances, but it's just mere intellectualism? Many years ago, the evangelical church, and I think probably because it wanted to, to um, you know, categorize people and get people to make certain. They, they came up with all different types of catechisms. You know, the different kinds of, and, and evangelical churches did the same. You know, uh, the Westminster Confession and, 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 and getting people to, to become members of churches and trying to, to make sure that, but you can't determine someone's faith by mere intellectualism. You can get all the intellectual answers right. It's possible that I could study the, a medical book, learn a lot of the procedures of medicine, know a lot about it, but I don't think you want me operating on you. There, there's a difference from this. Years ago, Rembrandt was being asked by one of his students. He could see Rembrandt's paintings, and, and he was curious of the the finer techniques, the, the hidden mysteries of, of being a fine artist. And Rembrandt said, you know what? you got to keep putting the things that you've learned into practice, and in good time, you will discover the hidden things you seek. you got to keep putting the things into practice. you got to quit worrying about things you don't know and start applying the things you do know. That's the only way you're going to get deeper. You see, a true artist is not one that's learned how to mix paints or somebody who's learned the, the rules of perspective. No, a true artist is a guy that puts the brush to the canvas and keeps painting. That's how you get better at anything. Why would we think that mere intellectualism is enough? We need to have experiential knowledge, and that is exactly the word he uses here in chapter uh, 2, verse 3, and again later on in verse 4 he, he, and verse 5. All these words of know is always experiential knowledge. 
It's all the type of knowledge that you gain by being in direct contact with someone. You cannot just have a know about somebody to think that you know them. And that's what he's talking about. You need to, you need to have this uh, relational aspect of it, and it is only the relational aspect of it. So you see why John would be saying this? John had had a relational aspect with Jesus Christ. He had walked with him three and a half years. He's now writing to a people that will never in this life physically meet him. And then the push towards intellectualism got people just to know, and of course, they were even moving away from the person and work of Christ. They were speaking that that relational aspect of Christ was not enough. And John is now arguing, saying, yes, it is. Because when you have an encounter, and he's going to talk about how to know that you have the difference of this. The apostle uses a Greek word that combines the benefits of this relationship. It, again, using the, the analogy of food, there are foods that, quite frankly, that are very beneficial for us. There are things that we can eat that are really good for us. We know they're good for us, but we don't much care for them. We don't want to eat them. We don't like them. They're always, isn't it interesting that most of the foods that are good for us that we don't, are the foods we don't like. <laughs> the donuts out there, not good for you, even if they're vitamin fortified. They're not good for you. And there, there are foods that we know that are good for us, but we, we prefer not to eat them. And then there are foods that are not good for us, and we won't, we'll lick the plate. They're so good. What John uses here in terms of being obedient, he says, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He uses a Greek phraseology that combines these two thoughts, combining the thought of the fact that the word of God and the commandments, the word of Jesus Christ, his words, his commandments, his precepts, if you will, are so beneficial for us, but they also taste really good. He combines them together that we wouldn't want to miss any of it. That's really he's talking about a maturing faith. That the commandments, again, speaks of the references not to the law of the First Testament, uh, but rather of the New Testament words of Christ, the, the things that Jesus spoke. Throughout this, I see a progression in the Christian life. There isn't a set time frame, because every time we look at Christianity and maturity, we often want to use this, and I've spoken of this before, of chronological age. If I ask anybody, how old are you in Christ? They're going to use the date that they received Christ to the date they are now. They're going to use a chronological age like we would our biological age. But John doesn't look at it that, and the Word of God doesn't. It looks at it on maturity. So I'm going to give you a new criteria of maturity in our life. Because I look at it as terms of obedience. Remember, he's talking about experiential knowledge, and he uses a phraseology here that indicates that there's a progression of maturity. In this case, if it's a truly transformative work, because it's impossible to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and not be transformed. You follow me? If you are not transformed, if you are not once dead but now alive, if you've never had a transformative work, you're not a believer. Now, I'm not saying that to be mean-spirited. I'm encouraging you to become a believer have a transformative work of Christ. But then the question is, how do I know I've had a transformative work? The first test is obedience. Well, how do I know? What does that look like? And I've come up with, if you will, a threefold way of seeing a progressive change in your obedience. Obviously, John's talking in verse 4 about those who had no transformative work. Look at verse 4 again. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments as a liar. The first thing is, is that if you have no desire to keep and trust the word of God in your life, you're not walking as he has walked, already mentioned earlier, then you're not a believer. But how do we know as a believer that we're progressing in our obedience and maturity? Well, it has to do with three phrases. Have to, need to, want to. Have to, need to, want to. Assuming you are a believer, I think there's a progressive obedience in our lives. 
There's a progressive nature to our maturity. Baby Christians, when they're newborn in Christ, they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they view obedience as have to. That's how they look. I have to go to church. I have to read my Bible. I have to witness. I have to give. I have to. I have to love my neighbor as myself. Have to. It, it, it is a terminology of that of a slave. It's not incorrect. It just indicates a beginning uh, stanza of maturity. It's like a slave responding to a master. And in this case, they view obedience of what will happen to them if they don't obey. In a negative sense, if they don't obey, they'll be punished. That's what a young Christian views obedience as. I have to go to church. Can you come? No, I have to go to church. See, it, it, it's an immaturity level. Now, at least they're going to church, and it does indicate that there's at least a maturing process. They have changed from, from death to life. They're not, not disobeying his commandment. They're not receiving to, uh, refusing to gather together as some do, as Paul mentions or the writer of Hebrews mentions. But the first stage is have to. The second stage, and this again is a further maturing process, I need to. And this is kind of like an employee and to an employer. You see, an employee, I need to go to work. He may not like his work. He may not like his job or the duties he has to do that day, but he needs to go because he likes the reward. If he doesn't go, he doesn't get paid. That's in a need to. And there's a maturing process that goes from I have to to I need to. I need to go to church today. Why? I really want to, but I need to. I want the reward of that. I know that I'm going to benefit from going. I, don't, I need to read my Bible today. I don't have to read my I need to do it today. Because I, I know that if I don't, you know, there's a reward process, I'll feel better. And it goes on. And, and again, that's a progressive nature of maturity in our life. And again, they don't necessarily always want to obey, uh, but they always want to be rewarded. <laughs> now, and I think about, the, and, and don't get me wrong, just because you went from have to to a need to, that you go back and forth in these things. There may be a day that you don't want to do anything and you have to. Or you need to. Uh, so just because there's a progression doesn't mean that there'll be times in your life that you'll switch from have to to need to. The, f the third one, and this is the one we ought to all get to and want to, and this all has to do with a growing relationship. Because initially, that relationship is developing. It's, again, if you just look at the stages of you know, of a human child, if you will. When you have a young child and you want them to make their bed, they have to. If they don't, they're going to get in trouble. I have to make my bed. Usually complain a little bit about it, but they do. They grow a little older, they need to. They don't necessarily like it, but they know they won't get their allowance unless they do. See, I need to. The maturing aspect of it is I want to. I want to. And that happens when we begin to really just fall in love with him. Obedience is no longer, in a case, a, a have to or a need to. It's I want to. I want to obey him. I don't, I don't yes, I, I, I'll be rewarded. And yes, I won't get punished. Those are not my motivation. You see, what's changing in this relationship is motivation. The deeper the relationship, the more you're motivated, not out of, of fear, not out of reward, but out of love. And that's really what you want in a relationship. I want to obey him. I, I, I desire to. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Didn't say, if you want to get rewarded, if you don't want to be punished. He said, if you love me. Jesus wants to motivate us. Now, as it works out in human terms, that look, I should want to serve my wife. I should want to dump the garbage. 
Not because I need to. It does need to be dumped. Not because I have to, because if I don't, she's going to lecture me, but because I want to, because I love her. And so when I see the garbage there and needs to be dumped, I just do it. Same thing in all of that. That's a relationship that's based upon love. That's what you want. That's what you want your children to do towards you if you have children. You don't want to be talking to the kids. And, you know, if, you, if they always maintain a have-to or need-to relationship, it's going to be a very narrow relationship. It's not developing. It's not nurturing. It's not maturing. So this is what John is, is trying to convey here to the readers of this. He wants to make certain that their motivation is changing. Again, he mentions the fact that there are some who are claiming to have a relationship that don't need to or want to or anything. He says as much. They're not motivated at all. Verse 4, he who says, I know him, claiming again to have an experiential relationship with him and does not keep his command, habitually keep his commandments, same word as used earlier, is a liar. I don't want to keep his commandments. I don't have to. But I am a Christian. Now, we see this all the time in society, especially election time. All the politicians claiming to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I watched just the other day uh, an interesting little interview. They were asking, I don't know anybody's commitment to Christ. But I, I was watching an interview with somebody trying to interview Joe Biden. I understand Joe Biden is Catholic, but staunchly pro-abortion. And this Catholic interviewer was asking Joe Biden, how can you be practicing Catholic that's against abortion and yet uh, uh, pro-abortion? How can you do that? I, this, you kind of got a conflict. And the guy, the reporter, I didn't see the whole interview, Apparently, his wife dragged him out of there before he could answer that or realized he would forget the question before ever, whatever the case might be. <laughs> but there is a contradiction. There was something that somebody was bringing forth. And again, I don't, I'm not here to say I, that Joe Biden is a believer or isn't a believer. I have no idea. Above my pay grade. I have some clues by his behavior, but I don't know. But I think interesting here that there are people that John was writing to is clearly saying this. But notice, he who says, the word phraseology, he who says, is an indication that this is for you to examine you. Is there an inconsistency in your life? We were talking about this uh, uh, just to, to Robin a moment ago. There, uh, Eric told me before he left, there was over, uh, per week, there's over 1,000 people. Uh, watch our services or, or something to do over every week. And uh, recently, when D Dominican Republic, we did a teaching, and, and after the teaching, we were there for several hours. Uh, one of the pastors came up to me, and of course, he speaks Spanish, I speak English, but Alta was doing the interpretation, and I, well, nice to meet you. And he goes, oh, I know you. And I'm looking at the guy going, mm, I don't know you. <laughs> but, you know, you're trying to be nice. Oh, okay. And I'm thinking, well, did I meet him last year? You know, because I hadn't been at this church before that I knew. I said, did I meet you? I didn't know. No, I, I listened to you. I've been listening to you for over a year on the Internet. And uh, I'm really blessed to have the opportunity to do that. It then dawned on me that had my behavior been inconsistent with the word that I was teaching, wow, I don't know if I like the Internet. Now, you know, I mean, if you have an inconsistent life or behavior to the word of God, you say, you know, and people are watching you. I mean, it's a different world now, isn't it? People on a whole hours away, different countries away are watching you. And then I realized, man, I, I need to realize that this isn't partial obedience. It needs to be full. I need I, I don't need to. I, I need to want to serve him in every capacity making sure I understand the connection to this. 
How do we have this? How does it grow? Verse 4 begins to unlock. I know him again. It's the initial phraseology he uses is of just letting you know that you can have a relationship. And somebody who, again, claims to have that relationship but that isn't walking with Christ, he's indicating it doesn't have him at all. And again, I know that saying that is such a harsh, caustic thing. Nobody wants to be called a liar, but really John's saying that you're calling yourself a liar. I'm not calling you anything. If you're not habitually practicing the truth, you say you've had a transformative encounter with Jesus Christ, but you're not habitually practicing the truth of the Word of God. Instead, you're habitually practicing others. I said this several weeks back, and, you know, we live in a society that human sexuality is so changed. People claiming they have a relationship with Christ, but yet are actively involved in an habitual homosexual relationship or an outside of marriage heterosexual relationship. Both of them are viewed the same biblically, yet claiming they have a relationship with Christ. I know it's not comfortable, but they should look at this passage and say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm lying. I don't have an encounter with Christ. Because I'm not habitually walking in obedience. Obedience is the first key sign of a transformative work. We want to follow. We need to follow it. We have to follow it. Whatever level you are on your beginning phrase, page, pages of your faith in Christ, these are the things that begin to indicate the relationship. John doesn't want any counterfeits. It was often talked about in the book of Acts Ananias and Sapphira decided and conspired to, to tell a lie in the church. And they were keeping some money aside, said they gave all the money to the church, but yet kept some of the portions for themselves. When first asked, Ananias lied about it, dropped dead. And then his wife was asked later, they just carried the husband out, and did you keep a certain amount for yourselves? And she lied, and she dropped dead. Now, it has been well said that people say, well, man, what, what would the church be like today if a lie would not survive? And somebody said, well, it would be a lot smaller church. <laughs> Others have said it would be a lot holier church. I, I'm not advocating that we should just have a, you know, funeral services preceding the service, but I am saying that you know, to have a church in the early church that was so wanting to obey the word of God, and and so um, conscious of not even, you know, stretching the truth, it's not a bad thing. It's interesting, again, that so much of the evaluation of, a, of successful ministry today has to do with numeric numbers, not with maturity. The New Testament doesn't ever address numeric numbers as a sign of successful church growth. It does address maturity, and every page on it does. And that's all that John's doing here. Second verse phrase in verse 5, he says, But whoever keeps his word... Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we're in him. Here's the second aspect of it, the word being in him. The first one was having experiential knowledge. Now, there's a union. The deeper the obedience in your life, the greater the union happens. You, you've had this relationship with people in your life where the longer you've been, and if you've been married for any length of time, when you start answering each other's sentences is one phase, and then when you start knowing what they think before they think it. The, the union of obedience and commitment when a relationship grows to such a level that you know those things. You can, you can look at someone and, and just be there and begin to understand even emotionally what they're going through by, by just watching them and looking at them. That's a relationship that's developed because of the experience and encounter. It's deepened. And it's, it's here the, the practical nature of that relationship. He says, now we have a oneness. He says that that comes by... And look at verse 5 again. again. He says, by this we know that we, we, are, we are in him. He says, truly the love of God is perfected in him. The love of God, the maturing nature of this, 
The word again keeps is habitually practice. It's that growing relationship from I have to, do I need to, or do I want to. The longer we are in Christ, the more mature it should be. We should be gravitating away from I have to and I need to, do I want to. John's describing that throughout the passages here. Our maturity. So we should not talk about how long we've known Christ numerically. We should be talking about how long we have had an encounter with Christ maturity-wise. Where are we? This isn't for me to judge with you. It's for you to judge with you. Am I still in a I need to or I have to obedience with Christ and I admit there'll be times that we're all on that. But that should be a conviction place. Is it, I want to. And again, just look at this. You ask, guys, ask your wife later how it makes her feel when you've done something. And she says, you didn't have to. You didn't have to do that, babe. And then you look at her and you say, but I wanted to. You, you do that, you're going to get a kiss. Because have to doesn't mean the same thing as I want to. I want to. I didn't have to do it. You didn't need to do that. No, I didn't need to do that. I didn't have to do that. I wanted to do that. Especially if it's self-sacrificial. Especially, guys, if the ball game's on and the Hallmark movie channel's also playing another series that is just the same. <laughs> and you turn off the ball game. And you say, hey, I want to watch the Hallmark movie with you. You don't have to. Yeah, I know, that's going to be, I haven't got that mature yet. I'm sorry, I'm just not there. But it's just that sense of, of growth and maturity. There's a difference, and we feel the same way. Maybe you didn't have to do that. I, don't, I know, but I wanted to. You know, when that relationship gets that way, you know that you have it's based on love, not based on anything else. There's a maturing prospect. And finally, in verse 6, he says, look, he who says he abides in him. And this is that, that loving uh, making your home with the abiding relationship is more than just a, a connection and a union. Now it's abiding. Ought to himself also walk as he's like, hey, as he has walked. There's this abiding relationship. Paul would say it later on in 2 Corinthians 5 14 that the love of Christ constrains me. I, I don't, I don't have to, I don't need to, I want to, and there's an abiding part of this that just goes on to some level. There's nothing greater to me. I mean, we, you talk about love relationships and on a human plane, and so much of the emphasis in the media is upon young love. When it's first uh, birthed, and people are in love. Well, you have several people tell me now, uh, when I tell them I've been married now a year and a half, after a 40-year marriage, now a year and a half, oh, you're still in the honeymoon phase, as if that it should diminish. They would talk about the, the romantic honeymoon period where you're gaga over other, as if that should diminish the longer you've been there. I think there's nothing more romantic than seeing a couple that's married 30, 40, 50 years that's more in love than they ever were prior. That's romantic love. That's the stuff that will last no matter what happens in your life. It's not based upon anything else. It's based on a deeper love and a commitment level. It should be growing towards that. I think our society has it wrong. We should be having love stories of codgers. Old oh, folks. I don't think the young people would be going to this, but the old guys have been married a few years and be going, yeah, you know. It'd be wonderful to see more of that depicted, kind of like the notebook. You know, you see that at the end of their life, where you read the letter to her and remind him how wonderful the relationship had always been, how he was committed to her, even though she wasn't healthy. 
Man, that's, that's the stuff that's for real. You ought to walk just as he's walked. It's a joint participation, which when we're close to him, our, our steps should match his steps. And that should just grow and grow. And again, I'm using physical relationship because sometimes it's just easier for us to understand what that would look like on a, on a physical plane so that we can understand the spiritual plane. But it doesn't really change the dynamic too much when we see that obedience is the first part of that. How do I know that I, I, I have the benefits of a relationship with Christ? Obedience. Obedience that's just continually growing, maturing, not how long I've known him. It's possible that you've known your neighbor 40 years, but that doesn't mean you know your neighbor. There's a relational relationship that ought to be growing, and that's the first sign that we can taste. Is, am I, is my relationship with Christ, is in terms of walking where he is walking in obedience, is it moving from I have to, do I need to, do I want? Would I, that's the key part of that. That's how it should be in our lives. And again, it's, I think, I don't know how that'll work in heaven. We're going to have some interesting dynamics when we see him face to face where we get to really see where our maturity in Christ really is. John wants you to have that encounter now so you can make the corrections now. Is it growing? Do I have a relationship with him? Am I receiving the benefits of that? Next week, we'll move into how that automatically, the obedience to Christ, would move into one of the most difficult areas, and that's loving our fellow man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that we'd continue to grow more in love with you. Lord, if there's anyone either here or watching on the internet that knows of you intellectually and doesn't have a real encounter with you, has never had an experiential encounter with the living God. And the words spoken here has brought that conviction to light. I pray, Lord, that they would just agree with that conviction and simply ask you to come and be the Lord of their life and enter into the relation. It doesn't matter how many years we spend in just mere intellectualism. It'll never transform into an experiential encounter with God if it stays in just mere intellectualism. We should not settle, Lord. We should fall more in love with you every day, growing in our relationship. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the words of your apostle John to redirect us into that. We thank you for this time in your word, in Jesus' name. Amen.